Hello children, it's good to be back with you after a week. You've already been through Sunday school a week ago, the morning service, and perhaps even the evening service. And so it's nice to be with you. Today we're going to be recapping a lot of the things that we've looked at in past weeks. And I want us to do this by looking at a map. I want you to draw a map in your mind and I'm going to mention a few places that I want you to imagine as we go back in time through what we've learned in Sunday school so far. I want us to look at five different places. The first one is where Jesus was born. Then we'll go to the place that his parents took him away to when they were running away. Then we'll go to where he lived and grew up and did many of his miracles and signs and wonders. Then we're going to go to our main event, the main place for our story today, the place that he went to when he asked his disciples who he was. And the last place we'll think about is the place where he fulfilled his mission. But before we open up the Bible and talk about all these things together, let's pray to the God who wrote the Bible that he would, by his spirit, enter our minds and hearts to shine light so that we can understand. Let's pray together. Oh, Father in heaven, you're the one who has given us the Bible. You're the one who has given us these accounts of Jesus that we're working through. And we ask that you help us understand who he was, what he came to do, and what his mission was, and how that relates to us today. We need you to open the word up to us, and we need you in order to understand it, and we need your strength to obey what it says. So please help us, we ask in his name, amen. So, I already said that the place that we're going to begin is where Jesus was born. Let's try a little experiment. Where was Jesus born? Some of you got it right. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This is where the angel of the Lord had appeared to Joseph and Mary and told them that he would be born. In fact, way back in the Old Testament, it was already prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Joseph and Mary went there for a census by the government where the Roman emperor had ordered everyone to be counted. And because that was Joseph's hometown, that was where they needed to go. And by the time they arrived, there was no room in the inn and Jesus had to be born in a stable. He was placed in a feeding trough and laid in a manger so that that is where he would lie as a newborn baby. So Bethlehem is the first place in our journey. And the second place that we're going to look at is the place where his parents ran away. Remember, Herod decided that all the babies around Bethlehem under two years old should die because he didn't want another king to come and take its place. Joseph and Mary were warned. And where did they flee to? That's right, some of you have got it right. They fled to Egypt. That is another prophecy that was fulfilled. And the book of Matthew gives so many prophecies so that the Jews would know that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Out of Egypt I called my son, God said. And that is exactly where God sent Jesus and his family to run away when the persecution of his family was on. The third question is also very important. Where did Jesus grow up? Jesus came back out of Egypt, but he didn't go back to Bethlehem. He went to a little town called Nazareth in the province or the place of Galilee. It wasn't a big city. It wasn't a very fancy place. It was a very simple town, a very small town. And that is where Jesus took up his trade as a carpenter along with his father and presumably later his brothers as well. And that is where Jesus grew up. And when he had turned 30 and begun his ministry, that is a place in which he did a lot of his signs and wonders, apart from places like Capernaum, even Samaria, and eventually the place he would go in order to be crucified. But before his crucifixion, there is a place that Jesus went with his disciples, and there he told them something very important. Which place is it where Jesus asked his disciples who he was? Not many of you got this right, but some of you did. The fourth place is a place called Caesarea Philippi. This is where Jesus asked the very important question that we're going to be considering today. He asked his disciples who he was. But we're not going to talk about that just yet. We have to ask about the fifth place on our map. Where is the place where Jesus went in order to fulfill his mission to die? A lot more of you got this right. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where the temple was. Jerusalem is where the rulers were. And that is where Jesus went to be the Passover lamb that would save all the people of God who had been promised to Jesus in eternity past. Jerusalem, right outside the city walls, is where Jesus would go on to be crucified. 
and we know that the story doesn't end with his crucifixion. But we're going to go back to the fourth place on our map, Caesarea Philippi. This is where Jesus asked a very important question, and I want you to read with me from Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13 going on. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, and it reads, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Wow, this is fascinating, and we need to go back into our history to understand exactly why this was important. Before this, Jesus had not told his disciples that he was the Messiah. He had not told them that he was the Christ. We are so used to hearing Jesus Christ like that, that we even think Christ is a surname. When Christ is a title that means anointed one, the same thing that Messiah means. And the Jews had been waiting for the promised Messiah, someone who would redeem them, someone who would save them. But over the years, as they had been punished and oppressed and colonized by the Romans, they had come to think of the Messiah as someone who would save them from Rome, who would give them their political freedom, who would help them be a free nation once again. And they weren't thinking about the Messiah in exactly the same way that the Old Testament prophesied the Messiah. And this is why Jesus didn't tell anyone he was the Messiah. When he came, people asked, could he be the Messiah? Could he be the chosen one? But Jesus didn't tell them that he was. In fact, when demons tried to say, you are the Messiah, we know who you are, Jesus would say, shush, silence, out of this man, leave this woman, because he didn't want people misassuming what he was when he was the Messiah. So it was really important that Peter answered the way he did. But what did Jesus begin by asking? He began by asking, who do people say that I am? And that's a good question. Who do people say that Jesus is today? Some people think he's a prophet. Some people think he was a good man. Some people think he was a liar. Some people don't even believe he really existed. And we have met many of our friends and many of our family members who have these different views of Jesus. Perhaps different views from what you hear at church, or hear from your parents in your home, or what you read in the Bible. But that's the question that he asked. Who do people say that I am? And we can see that the disciples answered that the people weren't really ready to accept Jesus as the Messiah. What did they say? They said he might be John the Baptist. Was Jesus John the Baptist? No, he wasn't. Jesus was John the Baptist's cousin. John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus. Others said he was Elijah. Was Elijah there? No, Elijah had gone to heaven hundreds of years before. In fact, the Bible says that the spirit of Elijah would rest upon John the Baptist. So that wasn't Jesus either. Some said Jeremiah. Jesus was not Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, the prophet who prophesied in Judah just before they went into exile in Babylon. He wasn't just one of the prophets, but that is what Jesus asked. Who do people say that I am? and we interact with people who say different things about Jesus. But Jesus asked something much more personal after that. He asked the disciples, but who do you say that I am? And that's the same question that I want to ask you today. It doesn't matter what someone else says about Jesus, whether it's your parents or your family members or your brother and sister or your friends or somebody that you don't really care to know, it doesn't matter what they say. What matters is who do you say that Jesus is? And I want to ask you children, do you think that Jesus is just a nice guy? Someone that you learn about in Sunday school who did many great things, who taught very hard things to understand, who did great miracles, someone who died and rose again? 
Do you believe that he didn't exist? Do you believe that he existed but you don't really care because it doesn't mean anything to you? The real question is the same question that Jesus asked his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Someone answered on behalf of the disciples, and it was Simon, Simon Peter, the de facto leader of the disciples. And he said something very important, something that Jesus hadn't said to him before, something that he didn't get from Jesus because Jesus had told him. He said something that God's Spirit had placed upon his heart. And we read it in this verse, verse 16. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter had seen what Jesus had done. Peter had experienced his greatness. Peter understood in the spirit that Jesus wasn't just an ordinary man. Jesus was the chosen one who had been promised in the Old Testament. Jesus was the anointed one of God. He was the Christ, the son of the living God. This is how every Christian begins, children. You have to begin by confessing that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. How does Paul tell us that we can be saved? He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He says that in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And that is how every Christian life begins. It begins with seeing Jesus for who he really is, even though we've heard so many sermons and so many Sunday school lessons and read so many books and read our Bibles, the moment that we are made alive by the Spirit of God, then we are able to see that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. This is what Peter saw, and that was the beginning of life in him. This is exactly how the church began. And Jesus talks about the church in the verses that follow. He said, you are now Peter. Peter means rock. Jesus is the one who gave him the name of Peter. He said, you are Peter. You are rock, the rock. And on this rock, not Peter, but on the rock of this confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is how I will build my church. Every individual brick in the building that is the church of God comes to know God in the same way by seeing Christ for who he is. And that is why this confession was so important. But I ask you again, children, do you understand that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? Some of you say you believe that, but has your life really changed? Have you repented of your sins, the things that make you an enemy of God? Have you trusted in Christ to take your sins on himself so that he can pay for them and you can receive eternal life? If you only think in your head that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, but you don't believe in your heart, you are not going to be saved. Your life will never change. And these disciples' lives changed because they believed in the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you guys have the keys to the kingdom. What did he mean? He didn't mean that they were going to decide who comes into heaven and who stays out, like some people believe. He was saying, you guys have received this truth from God. You have received the truth that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. This is the message that you need to go and preach to the world. And so children, for those of you who are Christians, do you realize that you have been given this great and glorious message? You have the keys to the kingdom because you have what it takes for people to receive eternal life. The words that you say, the life that you live, all of them are a testimony of the faith that you claim to have. If Jesus has really saved you, do you go out and tell people about Jesus? Or do you hide him under your bed? Do you hide him under a bowl? Do you keep your light hidden? If you do, you should wonder whether you really do have Jesus or whether you really do have light. So Jesus was very happy that Peter had said this and he blessed him and he blessed the disciples. But then Jesus went on to tell them, don't tell anyone that I am the Messiah. Remember, Jesus did not want people to misunderstand who he was. He didn't want people to think he was just coming to be a great king who would liberate and free them from the Romans. He wanted people to understand who the Messiah was someone who came to save them and redeem them from their biggest enemy and their biggest oppressor, which is sin. 
In fact, Jesus' own disciples didn't understand what the Messiah was really there to do. And that's why we have to continue reading Matthew chapter 16. Let's read from verse 21 this time. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned to him and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Wow. Five minutes ago, Peter was saying this great and glorious thing. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then a moment later, he's rebuking Jesus, who is God. He's telling Jesus off. And he's saying the things you're saying are not true. They're not going to happen to you. How dare you say you're going to die? And this shows something very important. Even the disciples didn't understand what God's plan was. So let's look at God's plan. Let's look at Jesus' plan. Let's look at the disciples' plan. Let's look at the devil's plan. And then let's see what plan we as boys and girls, men and women, must be following. Jesus had his own plan. What was the disciples' plan? When they heard that he was the Christ, their plan was to see him enthroned in the city of Jerusalem over Israel, vanquishing and defeating the Romans who had oppressed them. And of course, we know that the disciples also thought that they would have privileged positions of power because they were Jesus' closest friends and his disciples. That was their plan, to see Jesus enthroned as an earthly king. But what was Jesus' plan? Jesus had one goal, and the Bible tells us that he set his face like a stone or like flint towards that goal. Nothing would move him. His goal was to honor God and obey God who had sent him. So Jesus' plan and the disciples' plan were not the same. What about Satan's plan? Why did Jesus say this very strong thing to Peter? Imagine calling your friend Satan. Imagine saying to your best friend, Get behind me, Satan! Why did Jesus say such a hard and harsh thing to Peter? We have to understand what the devil's plan was. The devil's plan was to keep Jesus from dying so that sinners would not be saved. The devil, remember, he had come to tempt Jesus all the way back in the wilderness, and he had tried to make Jesus take the easy way out. He had tried to make Jesus disobey God. He had tried to make Jesus take the earthly kingdoms and not go to the cross and die the way that God had said. And so the devil's plan and the disciples' plan was more in common than the disciples' plan and Jesus' plan. What plan did Jesus choose? Did he choose the easy way? Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And he said it to his friend, Peter. Why? because Jesus had chosen the plan that was the plan of God. Jesus had chosen to go through with what God had designed. And this is exactly what he was telling his disciples. I have to die, and on the third day I will rise. That was God's plan for Jesus, and therefore that was Jesus' plan for himself. Jesus also told his disciples that if you're going to be my true disciples, you're going to have to suffer like I do. The world hates me because I am righteous. It is going to hate you because you're my disciples. The world is going to put me to death for being righteous. The world is also going to put you to death for being my disciples. And the disciples had to change their whole plan of seeing Jesus as an earthly king and recognize that he was bigger than that. He was the Messiah. He was there to die as the atonement lamb, the Passover lamb for the sins of the world. So, boys and girls, what does this mean for us? What plan do you have in life? Do you plan to make a lot of money and marry someone pretty or marry someone handsome and have few kids and have a lot of cars and a lot of land, a lot of houses, and then die happy? Or is your plan to walk the way that Jesus walked in obedience to God, even if it means suffering for the name of God? 
Most of us don't live in a country where we're going to be persecuted by being killed for being Christians. But many Christians, even today, are killed because they believe in Jesus. Many Christians today are put to death or put in prison or tortured and beaten just for the fact that they believe in Jesus. Maybe that's not your story, but maybe you have to go to school and people laugh at you and make fun of you, which also isn't pleasant. It's also not nice. Maybe you have to say no to things that look fun that everyone else is doing, but you know that they are not what God wants you to do. God's plan for you, Jesus' plan for you, is obedience to God. That is how you show that you love him. Is that your own plan for yourself? The disciples did die. Every single one of them except one was murdered. One was put on an island and exiled and he died there. All of them died for the name of Christ. All of them suffered in life. They were beaten, they were chased from their homes, they were blacklisted, all because they believed in Christ. But these same disciples, they saw the glory of God as we will be learning very soon about the transfiguration. They saw the resurrected Christ. They received all the blessings that Christ had promised and there's still more blessings for them to receive even today. Are you going to be a disciple of Christ? Are you going to receive the blessings of obedience? Are you going to follow God's plan for your life? I pray that each one of you children will choose to commit their life to Christ, the Christ that Peter confessed as the son of the living God, and that by that you will be blessed, that you will receive eternal life and every blessing that God gives us in Christ Jesus. I hope you pay attention to the sermon today, and I hope these things stick in your mind, and I pray that they do, so that if you are not saved, that you will turn to Christ in repentance and be saved. And that if you are saved, you will follow God's plan for your life and live exactly the way that he wants you to live. Thank you, children, and have a good Sunday.